Good morning. Pastor Jeff Fairley with Faith and Grace Fellowship. Coffee time. Started just a couple minutes early to give you all an opportunity to see it pop up in your Facebook and join. If you're seeing this other than uh, February 26th, 2023, then it's been recorded. And uh, we'd love for you to go, if you're on YouTube, <coughs> if Faith and Grace Fellowship YouTube channel, like and subscribe. If you're on Facebook, let me know when you're watching this, when you're seeing these videos, uh, like these sermons. And if they are doing anything for you, uh, we are in a series right now about giants and giants in land. So I'm going to continue working on that today. <clears throat> Just give them another minute to give people time to get on here. We usually start this a few minutes early and we start Saturday, Sunday mornings, 11 a.m. Central Time. We put this up so that everybody can watch from wherever they are. Excuse me. It's been a week. It's been a week. Well, good morning, Pastor Jeff Fairley from Faith and Grace Fellowship. As I have already said, our opening scripture comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. It's always good to look to Jesus. There have been movements throughout all of uh, the time that I've been a Christian where there was the Jesus movement in the 60s, 70s. And there was the Messianic movement looking to Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus is the Messiah. There was the WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? We all heard the bands, we read the books, we watched the shows, and we, we asked ourselves, what would Jesus do in this situation? So the scripture says, looking into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He has written the book on your faith. He showed us the way, and he completed it, then he says, walk in it. He's the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. There was no joy in the cross. There was joy going through the cross because of what it would do for us. Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We have this promise where Jesus is, is at the right hand of God the Father. The place of honor because of what he did for you and for me. And so we need to keep our eyes on him, looking to Jesus. Amen? Before I started today, I, I opened the Bible. I like to, I like to kind of grab a, another opportunity for Scripture before uh, even starting, just myself and the Word. And I opened up to Jeremiah 20, Jeremiah 33. I like to call this God's phone number when I get to Jeremiah 33. Verse 3. But I want to read the first three verses here. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time while he was still shut up in the court of the guard, saying, Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it to establishment, the Lord is his name. Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things, fenced in and hidden, which you do not know, do not distinguish and recognize, have knowledge of, and understand. In the New King James, verse 3 is, Call to me and I will answer you. That's God's phone number. He asks us to call him. You say, why should I pray to God? Because God's asking you to. Call unto me and I will answer you. God doesn't have call waiting. He's always there. Amen? Just wanted to add that today. As we go to the Lord in prayer, there's a number of things we need to pray for. Um, continue to pray for Rita Hoffman. She's doing a lot better. Getting stronger. I thank God for that. Pray for Kathy. We had an issue this week where she started having some back pain. It really got bad. It, it progressed through the week. That We ended up in the ER. And she ended up being admitted. We ended up working um, with the doctors in that. And she was able to get out the next day. They got her pain under somewhat control. It's a sciatic uh, impingement 
they're going to need to do some more things if uh, if that's the way it goes to to help release that. We're believing God also for God to touch her as we're uh, as we're going through what she's going through. We've got to get a, a physical therapist and things like that so she can start doing her exercises, and find out what they are, and get strengthened and loosened up. So at this point, pray for Kathy. She's she was in a lot of pain this morning. Uh, we finally got that broken, so we're fighting those battles back and forth. But these are things we all uh, run through. I'll lift you up in your situations if you lift up us in ours. Continue to pray for Keith, Wil Keith Wilson's family and what God's doing there. Lisa Hunsell, Aunt Darlene, Aunt Jane, my mom, my cousin Steve, my brother Mark, uh, Sam Crabtree. Levi and Destiny Miller, some unspoken requests, Rob and Robin Ballinger. There's a lot of needs that people have today, and we we want to lift them up each week, and we're going to do that here in a minute. We always pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122.6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that they prosper who love you. I don't know anybody that doesn't like to prosper. I mean, I, I, I don't see people sitting back and just okay, I'm so poor and I'm just going to live this way and I'm <clears throat> I'm terrible and I can't do this and I, I don't want anything, don't need anything. Everybody has dreams and desires to, to have a better life and have better something. That's what sparks the human imagination. And God says that if we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, he's also wanting to place on us additional prosperity. Why? Because Jerusalem is the apple of his eye. If we are looking to the things and honoring him and praying for what he's wanting to accomplish, he says, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to do things in your life. So we pray for that because we're, we're asked to pray for Jerusalem, not just the city and the, the nation, but all the people, wherever they might be, that are called by the name of Abraham. We pray for workers for the harvest, people to parents and to disciple new believers. There are revivals hitting out all over the United States in various colleges and various churches and various places. And anybody coming in to know to meet the Lord needs to be discipled. But you can't just you know, you wouldn't go uh, have a baby, take him out of the hospital and walk home with the baby and set it down and say, "Now, kid." You need to get yourself a job, and you need to start cleaning your room. No, you got to parent, you got to nurture, you've got to do things to get that child to the point where they learn through life to get to the point where they can be self-sustaining. It's the same with believers. So we've been praying for about five years for workers for the harvest to parent people, praying for the revivals that are happening now so that people would be ready. <coughs> we pray against the spiritual state of wickedness in this area. That's according to Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 18. It says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound from heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed from heaven. We'll get into that here in a second. Pray for those looking for jobs. I'm one of them. Uh, for those needing income, needing God to uh, work in their hearts and lives, we ask God to meet your need wherever you're at. If you're needing increased income and, and or decreased outgo, that God, according to his word, be honoring you in your request and we'll put our faith with you as well and any other prayer requests that we have uh, if it's according to the will of God and the word of God I'll add my faith with yours so as we pray you go ahead and ask God for situations from Jeremiah 33 3 call on to me and I will answer you God's on the phone ready no call waiting he wants to hear your request so let's pray Father, we pray according to Psalm 122.6. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We ask you to meet the needs of your people in Israel. We pray for peace in the country, peace in the nation, peace in the, in the government. And wherever Adam, Abraham's seed are throughout the world, that you give them peace and safety and blessing. As believers, we are called spiritual seed of Abraham. And so we're praying for all believers as well, that you give peace and safety and protection to your, your, your flock. And we thank you, Lord. We pray for workers for the harvest, Father, that people would, would take it on themselves to learn how to disciple another believer, how to teach them to pray, how to teach them to walk in 
uprightness and how to teach them to read the word and to be an overcomer, to be a, a good fellowshipper and how to grow and then how to share their witness. That they grow the same way that a, a human child grows and learns and is nurtured and taught and protected that the church would take up this mantle and, and be ready to do this as revivals are springing all across the nation, that these ones that are finding you would not be lost in the mix, that they would be captured up and be trained into the army of God that you have already decided for them to do. We lift up this nation. Father, in the nation, this, the, the city we're in, I take authority in this city in this county, in this state, in this federal region, in our nation, in our federal government, and I bind the spirit of wickedness that is permeating our land. I bind the spirit of wickedness and lawlessness and in unrighteousness in the, the kind of laws and the kind of things that are trying to happen to turn our country and destroy it. And I loose the Holy Spirit into hearts and lives of believers that believers would get on their knees according to Chronicles, they would get on their knees and call out to you, Father, and humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, and that you would heal the land. I thank you there's revival happening, and I pray that the Holy Spirit move into hearts and lives and homes, living rooms, cars, dens, wherever people are watching various messages of your word, that the Holy Spirit would permeate those places, and the, we loose that according to Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. We bind the spirit of wickedness and we loose the Holy Spirit into hearts and lives and homes that the church be the church and we start making a difference in the atmosphere, Father. <clears throat> I pray for those needing jobs or needing increased income that, Father, you do, according to your word, everything that is to be done to give them a purpose and a hope. You give all of us a Derek, a path, and you have a plan for our hope and not for our destruction. And I thank you for that, Father, and I ask you to, to meet the need and lift up these families that are struggling financially through COVID or loss of loved ones or loss of income, or the income has been stretched because of the outgo that has gone up. I pray for a decrease in the outgo, and I pray for a blessing on your people. Minister, Father, open doors, make ways where there doesn't seem to be any ways show people how to economize and how to make things work bring your, the generosity of your church back into vogue that the church starts seeing the need of others and take those needs into account we we'll give you the glory the honor and the praise father and father i pray for all of the requests that people have on their heart and life that they need today including these that we mentioned already father that you meet the need you heal those and deliver those that are in need of healing that you touch them even right now on the 26th of February, this day, that your healing hand and virtue flow to where they are and they start feeling and noticing something different because you're on the throne. We're told in Isaiah and we're told in in, in 1 Peter 2.24 that by the stripes of Jesus, we are already healed. We claim that healing in our physical bodies as much as we claim salvation in our soul and we give you the glory and the honor and the praise in jesus name amen and amen for those that want to uh, to give to our ministry you can go to fgfellowship.org fgfellowship all is one word dot org go to the giving cab and you can put your information in it goes through tidally we don't get any of the uh, of your card or bank information they just send the funds over to us and it helps us to support the benevolence of many different ministries or, or people we've been able to help some families through this time that uh, said they would, didn't have any hope and we've been able to help some of them so God is, has provided that but our offering scripture today comes from Luke chapter 6 verse 38 give and it will be given to you a good measure Pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So if, if a person takes a thimble and puts uh, flour in it and tamps it down and everything, it's going to be a packed thimble full. But if they take a bucket and they do the same and they dump it out, it's going to be a bucket full. God says the way that we measure in our giving 
he will give back to us. You see, that doesn't make sense. You see, God is the God of giving. The Hebrew word for love is ahava. It means to give. The Greek word for agape, which is to love giving without receiving back or expecting back. God is the God of love. We're told that. He's the God of light. He's also the God of giving. John 3.16 is the best offering scripture for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave all that he had because he cared for you. I want to pray over the offerings that have come in and what God has, has helped and allowed us to do this week for ministries and for families. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of the gifts that have come in and I ask you to bless them. We receive them into your care. Help us to be good stewards of everything that's come in so that we can minister according to your will for each of the families that need what they need and for all the ministry issues that come up. I thank you, Lord, for that. And I give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. I also pray for the giver, Father, that they see their giving, their tithe, their offerings, returned into their lap, into their purse, into their bank account, and they see the blessing coming on them because your word says so. That as they measure, you measure back to them, but you measure back in so much more than they ever gave in the first place. Father, I give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Each week we lift up the Word of God and we make our confession. I confess and I declare that this is the Word of God. God cannot lie. His Word is true. We accept it, we believe it, we receive it. We live according to grace by faith. The blood of Christ has redeemed us and set us free from sin, sickness, bondage, and separation from God. And we are free because of Christ's substitute work on the cross. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we have, uh, this would be week four of the weeks that we've had it. I, I know that for two weeks there I had COVID and, and bronchitis in, in the middle of this, so it was kind of a broken time frame. But we've been talking about giants out of Deuteronomy 7. And they were physical people back then and physical situations and, and things that they were doing that God uh, commanded that the children of Israel have nothing to do with them. I'm just going to read the... Uh, Again, De Deuteronomy 7, 1, and then we'll go on and talk to this next uh, one of the nations. Deuteronomy 7, 1 says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. Before I... Going further, I want to ask for God's anointing. Father, I pray that you deliver through me the message of life and hope to the people listening today. Father, I pray that you give me the anointing and help me to deliver this the way that you've given it to me. I give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of the things mentioned in this verse, first of all, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, they were still on the other side of Jordan. They were still over in the, the wilderness area. They hadn't gone over yet. And as a matter of fact, because of the, the spies going in and 10 of them giving a bad report, they end up spending 40 years out in the wilderness so that those that said, yeah, let's not go in there, that generation died off except for Joshua and, and Caleb, the two spies that gave the good report, and, and all the children of a certain age on down, of the, the children of Israel, they were the ones that went into the land. So God says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, many times we stop ourselves from getting what we deserve when we deserve it because of our unbelief, like the t 10 spies that got the whole nation to say, no, we're not doing it. God had already said, when he brings you into the land, there's a promise. You're going into the land. There is something God's going to do for you over there. 
which you go to possess. You're not going to just live and intermingle among them, but to possess it. You will take it over. It will all be yours. And many times in our spiritual lives, we don't go and possess our spiritual life. We don't take God's word at face value that he's giving us the land. We don't take possession of what he's given us. We don't look into the word to see what does it say for me and my house. What is God telling us to do? None of that. We, we put it aside and kind of say, yeah, well, okay, that was Sunday school, that was church, now I'm on to something else. God goes further and says, and has cast out many nations before you. I'm going to go fight with you, he said. You go in, I'm going to give it to you, you're going to possess it, and I'm going to cast them out before you. You're not going in alone. We know the word says that he will never leave you or forsake you. God goes with us. And then he names the seven different uh, nations. Now, there was well over 30 some, 36 different nations when you read uh, closer to the end of Joshua's life of the nations that were actually kicked out. But there were seven specific in this passage. And in some other passages, some of these were left out. But uh, there were seven, at least seven nations that God said, these you will utterly destroy. These you will have nothing to do with. And you read on in Deuteronomy 7, it talks about not to give your sons to them as, as uh, in marriage, not to take their daughters in marriage, not to uh, partake in the things that they do. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but God had a specific reason for this for the people at this time. They had, Remember, they just came out of Egypt. They had been... 430 years in slavery doing what they did being told what to do and God's bringing them out into a total deliverance and wanting them to become that nation that honors him he chose them not because they were the most the biggest army or the the most intelligent but because of the love he had for them and for Abraham and he gave made a promise to Abraham and he was fulfilling that promise, you will be my people and I will be your God. Amen. <clears throat> Just to recap, we talked about two of the different uh, tribes. One was the Hittites. And that Hittite meant one who is broken or who fears and literally means terror, fear, and confusion. And how many times do ter this terror, fear, and confusion in your life change you from making the right choice? Something's happening and all of a sudden you have either a, a rational or irrational fear and you change gears and try to do something else. Sometimes it's it's what keeps you from getting hurt worse. Other times it stops you from going forward like the children of Israel. They had terror. They're like, we're like grasshoppers in their sight and, and we're like grasshoppers in, in our, they're like grasshoppers, we're like grasshoppers in our sight before them and they're like grasshoppers. Or we're like grasshoppers in their sight too. There's there's a fear, there's a terror, there's a, oh my gosh. They could step on us and they don't even need a sword. They run fast, they're huge, they're, they're terrifying. So the Hittites, there was a terror about them. There was fear, there was confusion. And then we talked about um, the Amorites. Amorites are bitter babblers. A bitter, a rebel, a babbler. <coughs> <coughs> Today we would call them Debbie Downers or uh, Karens. The kind of things that uh, you get into a, uh, uh, talking to a believer about something, they say, yeah, but. The, the Eeyore, they've got the black cloud with them and nothing, no matter what is, is positive about it, is always uh, accentuating the negative. And that bitterness, that, that, that root of bitterness, as we talked a few weeks ago when we talked about the sycamine tree, that root of bitterness is like sending out the wasps to sting the fruit in other people's lives, and it spreads bitterness. It doesn't ever bring peace. And so God didn't want the terror to be leading and guiding you, and he didn't want people being led and guided by bitterness and by, by confusion and by constant bickering and complaining. And so we talked about those two in depth. 
I'm going to bounce back because the Amorites was actually the third one. Bounce back to Girgashites. Now there's a lot of different things about Girgashites here that we're going to go through some things to kind of lay some groundwork and then and see how we can make this happen for you. But this is one of the, the nations that was mentioned here and in a couple other places, but not in all the lists. The Gergesites were called um, Midlanders, or the middle of the middle of the area, clay people. They they were um, dwelling in clay soil type thing, but it also means to turn back or return back. And so the the uh, Gergesites were the descendants of the fifth son of Canaan, and one of the original tribes in Israel. And in the land of Canaan before the Israelites were there. According to what I was reading on this, there's not much known about them, even the origin of the name, the exact geographic location are mysteries. Uh, some people argued the Gergesites were later known as the Gadarenes or the Gerasenes in Matthew 28. Uh, the Smith's Bible Dictionary interprets the word Gergeshite to mean dwelling on a clay soil and argues that the Gergeshites possessed land east of the Sea of Galilee, thus aligning it with the position of Gadara mentioned in the New Testament. For that, I want to jump to Luke chapter 8 and read a few verses about the uh, only passage we have about Gadara. Starting with verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out of the land, there he met a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him with a loud voice, What have I to do with you, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I beg you to not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demons into the wilderness. <clears throat> this is the story about the Gadarean area. And if this is where the Girgashites had been and the type of things, we'll talk more about that here in a minute. But this is one of the thoughts that this is the, the same offshoots of the Gergeshites as far as that that region. When you read the story on, you understand that there was uh, uh, a legion of demons in this man because when they begged to be cast into the pigs, there were about 2,000 of them, they ran off into the cliff and drowned. Interestingly enough, up on top of the hill was a temple in that area. It's been found. And that temple was not a temple to God. It was a temple to a god, little g, meaning a uh, pagan god, where at this time, even when Jesus was there, there were people sacrificing pigs to this god. These were the sacrificial animals for that temple. Interesting. Not only did Jesus deliver the man who had unclean spirits, let the spirits go into the sacrificial animals and then they all ran off into the sea and died. Of course, then the demons went wherever. But it wiped out the ability for the priests of that to continue doing their sacrifices to an unholy God. Jesus delivered a man, freed up an area, and set things right as far as idolatry all in one shot. Second Corinthians chapter 6 starting verse 14 says do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion with less light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part of a believer has a believer with an unbeliever? And that agreement, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, 
Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This in the New Testament portrays back through what happened at Gadareth, portrays back what happened with and, and where the Girgashites were in Deuteronomy 7, there was so much wickedness going on in those seven nations that God was giving the children of Israel a physical do not do anything with these people, don't have anything to do with them, don't, uh, don't live among them, totally wipe them out, get rid of them because he did not want them going the soft way. Oh, well, they can do this, okay, so we'll do that. People will follow the easy path. In the New Testament, as I just read, God says there's a reason I don't want you to be intermingled like this. It doesn't do you any good. It actually tears you down. I want relationship with you, not to share you with other idolatrous gods. Okay? <clears throat> Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 7. In verse 4, Moses speaks of following me. The meaning, of course, being follow God. Moses was used the first person singular pronoun because he was speaking in the name of God. The command to break down the altars in Deuteronomy five or seven five, and to dash the piece their pillars, to cut down the Asherim, and to burn their graven images with fire it shows how completely. The people were to be eradicating paganism from the promised land. Pillars, we think of a pillar, we think of uh, something that a pier or, or a, uh, a building material that holds a roof or something up or porticoche up. It's a pillar. It supports from beneath to above so that something can be there. But these pillars were just obelisks. They were there for a religious reason. They were standing stone or wood columns connected with the worship of Ashram. Several of these uh, had been found, and they were considered phallic symbols erected to worship uh, the male principle in the vulgar sexual cults of Balaam. And so these pillars that they were cut down is because they were they were saying that man's uh, ability to procreate was like a god and they were worshipping these gods with these pillars Asherim these were representations in wood of the old Semitic goddess Asherah there's some doubt of this definition because the KJV King James Version renders this word groves Many times it was many different uh, tree-like structures. And groves are essential in pagan worship. So not only was the pillars, but so were the, the ashram. There was also child sacrifices because in these sexual things that people would get pregnant and then they would offer up those children once they were born as sacrifices to their gods. Uh, Molech was one of them. If you give me your child, if you pass it through the fire of Molech, that I will, uh, you, you will have fertility. You've already got one child. Why kill one so you can have multiple more? I mean, the, the mindset that these people was just terrible. And it would, you know, when you get to the point where someone's giving that kind of a, of a lifestyle, oh, you should come join us. You know, we're the swinger church. Or we're, we're, we're really out there. You can, you can do anything you want here. Nobody's going to say a thing. Matter of fact, we encourage you. That's not the love of God. And that's not following God. That's following flesh. And that's what these pagan nations were doing. And God says, this is not going to be good for you. God wanted his people to serve him. And not the gods of the Canaanites. I was reading something in a uh, commentary, G. H. Davis's commentary, and he says, 
this command is given in order to prevent idolatry, the command to, to have nothing to do with them and, and even to wipe down wipe out and break down all these things. Now for Deuteronomy, idolatry can only have one outcome, and that's the destruction of Israel. It's through idolatry and only through idolatry that Israel can destroy itself. No nation was standing against it, but internally, Israel could destroy itself inwardly by stopping serving God and starting to serve these non-gods. The choice before Deuteronomy was either to live with these people in Canaan, which would inevitably bring about adultery and idolatry, so the, and so the death of Israel, or to destroy these people and remove the great cause of idolatry. It's more evil to be idolatrous than to slay these people. Thus the real meaning of idolatry for uh, Deuteronomy began to be clear for us, even though many moral difficulties in the command remain. You say, how could God say, wipe them all out? <clears throat> um, we saw some of this with some of the, um, the uh, radical stuff that went through the Middle East, and some of our men and women, brave men and women, fought against this. The black flag in uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq and other nations. When an idolatry is so deeply ensconced in the people, all the way down to the children, they were teaching children to kill infidels and just and honoring it. And hey, you're being a good martyr, and teaching them to put on vests and walk out there and blow themselves up so they would kill infidels. You know, when idolatry and, and ideology get together, you're worshiping a different God and your God tells you kill, 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 kill and life is, is uh, not worth anything, then there's, there's very little you can do to stop that. And so God knew that the only way to take care of this in that time, not only did they have to tear down all of their worship, and you can't tear down their worship places without fighting them, so he essentially declared war on them, and they fought to the end and did wipe them out. Uh, when you think about idolatry in Christianity and Judaism, it's the worship of something other than God as though it were God. Now, we don't have Asherah poles. We don't have pillars. Up, we don't have these kind of things. But what do we have that comes against what God has said? In modern day idolatry, um, we, er, we worship at the altar of materialism. It feeds our need to, be, to build our egos and to get more stuck. We also worship at the altar of our own pride and ego. It often takes a form of obsession with careers and jobs. I'm such a workaholic, I can't do anything but. I'm, this is who I am. I, I'm wired this way. And third, we idolize mankind through naturalism and the power of science. We cling to the illusion that we are lords of our world and build our self-esteem to godlike proportions. <clears throat> the ability to uh, meet new frontiers, the ability to to uh, wipe out all evil. Look at some of the the movies and cartoons and things. Kids, you know, the, the I don't want to say anything against the superheroes, but Hey, how many people are wanting to be superheroes? How many people are trying to be superheroes? Not just in uh, putting on a costume, but and going to Comic Con or something. But they're actually trying to be the He-Man. They're trying to to be to build or or make the better man, the six million dollar man. We have the technology; we can rebuild him. We we get into these things. And we, these things became idolatry when they stand up between us and God. And finally, and most destructively, we worship at the altar of self-aggrandizement. 
of the fulfillment of self to the exclusion of all others. Me, 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 me. The, the child that sits down at the table and scoops all the food over to him and says, this is all mine. I don't care what you got. They go and, and grab everything so that their needs and desires are met instead of being a sharing person, a caring person. See, God so loved the world that he gave. He could have said, y'all are on your own. I built you guys without sin. Adam and Eve sinned. We're out of here. We're going to go start something else someplace else. But what did he do? He put together the plan of salvation. He stayed with us. He said, hey, Jeremiah 33, 3, call on me. You having issues? Call me. I'll answer. I'll send my son. It'll cost him his life so that you can be with me forever. He didn't give up on us at all. Now, I want to say there's nothing wrong with us, uh, with stuff in our lives, or working on career advancements, or true science, or even being fulfilled. There's nothing wrong with that. It's when we take it to the next levels. When we take it to the levels where it becomes bigger to us than God is. It's when they take on a worship of their own that they become a problem. We all watched major sporting events where fans became so unruly when their teams won that nothing else mattered. Thank God there was no destruction in Kansas City when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. Other cities around the country have had riot squads on standby when their teams won. Other times it was when their teams lost. There was burning, there was looting, there was there were people injured, there were cars flipped over, police cars, uh, uh, police officers being uh, battled, people throwing rocks and tear gas going and, and all kinds of things, and then destruction. They're, they were in idolatry of their team. They were idolizing their team to the point that it was a god to them. I, I like my Kansas City Chiefs. I really do. I like watching it. I like I like being uh, no other conversations going on when we're watching them. Hey, it's Chiefs time. But then it's still just a game. It's an entertainment. They're, they're millionaires running around doing things to entertain us. And I've got some, some uh, hey, this is my city, and I'm, and I'm all for them. I've been a Chiefs fan forever. I would never think about rioting because they lost, let alone rioting because they won. But people do. Soccer teams, there have been many people that have died at soccer matches or, or different places because people lose their mind and they forget this is an entertainment entity that turns into their self-fulfillment to the point that it becomes a god to them. That's when we've gone from following God to doing our own idols. So these type of actions where people are looting and getting hurt and doing things because their team won or lost, it shows the mindset of going overboard in idolatry to their sport. And that's only one type of example. You can fill in others as you, as you go along. Basically, we take things too far. When we're showing our worship attitude to that kind of activity or event. And this is today when we're supposedly more intelligent and, and more knowledgeable than they were back in the day. Well, I can't say that we are or aren't. Mankind has been mankind. But back in the day, when they came out of Egypt and all of a sudden, hey man, we can go over here to this place and we don't have to do all these 613 laws that God has. We can go over here and we can do a whole bunch of things and these folks are making it okay. They're getting, they've got food, you know, they've got rain, they've got uh, crops. They're prosperous. Why should I do all this that God said over here? Why can't I just do what being said over here and, and, and uh, hey, you know, they're good looking people. They're good looking neighbors. And God knew the outcome spiritually that would bankrupt the nation of Israel. And see, the nation of Israel needed to be established and in place and, and set up 
because the Messiah was coming through Jesus, through Israel. And he had to be born in the land of Israel from the lineage so that he could be the sacrificial lamb for us to forgive us of our sins. So if God didn't have these things wiped out and get rid of these things in their lives, he knew it would taint their whole existence and possibly even the salvation of everybody else in the world. God had a plan. He just asked the people to follow that plan. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for me. These things, we find these kind of things in our lives in a spiritual, emotional, and, and mental aspect sometimes that we need to get them out of our lives. Now, we're not going around uh, taking up swords against people, but we need to do that from our lives. What giants are in your land that need to be getting up, gotten out? What giants of these types of situations do we need to understand how Scripture tells us that we can be an overcomer? 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. All of us, all of us have thoughts and issues and things that come up in our lives. But God says, if we're sober-minded about this and we will be careful and watch, know the enemy, the devil, is going to try to trip us up. He's going to try to get us to give up what we've been given. A roaring lion is a terror lion. It scares you. It doesn't say a ravaging lion, a hungry lion, one that can touch you. But he gets you so terrified and so fearful and so falling back these, remember these, the Girgashites were those who returned back. They didn't continue to follow the pattern that God had put out. That God, you know, the people of Israel would fall back and return to the, the old ways. Make it easy. Forget going the right way. Forget what God said. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to fall back. I'm going to be a clay people. I'm not going to, you know, all that kind of stuff. God says, be sober-minded and be watchful, knowing that these things have happened, and you're aware of it, it's open-minded, you're thinking about it, you're saying, hey, I've got to be watchful. But I'm not the only one. There's others that are in this same situation, so we're in this together. But God said he would take us through. Basically, we need to keep our heads about us even when all others are losing theirs and be sober-minded. Jesus gives us the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, where he prays for all believers, not just those disciples, but he says for even those who believe on the word, on the word that they share. And each one of us have heard the word of God because of the disciples. And so this prayer is for us. I want to read a couple of verses out of John 17. Start with verse, 16, verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. This is Jesus praying for you to be protected from the enemy. Pretty good. The Lord of all creation is praying for you to be protected. Amen. John chapter 15, verse 19 says, If you belonged to the world... It would have loved you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are children of God, and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We don't have to live in the world system as sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are citizens of heaven. Jesus himself is praying for us. It says he's seated right hand of the Father, and he's making intercession for us. He's praying for you right now that you make it, that the things in your life that are overcoming you, 
would stop overcoming you and you would start seeing some victories in life. You'd start seeing some things that used to be fear, used to be negative Nancy and, and Debbie Downer and Karenisms and used to keep you from from getting in, get you to squabbling or getting you to fall back. That's it. I'm not going forward anymore. I can't do it. I, I, it's too hard. It's too rough. That whole, those are all spiritual things that we as individuals have to fight against and come against in our lives. These Gergeshites were physical people doing physical things that God abhorred. And he knew if his people got intermingled with those people, you wouldn't know the difference. We battle the flesh in our walks with God, the physical flesh. We have spiritual battles to fight so that we can be victorious. God says that we are overcomers. Why? Through the blood of the Lamb. They overcame them with the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb. What's the word of your testimony? I'm going to follow you, God. I'm not going to be a Debbie Downer. I'm not going to be a bitter battler. I'm not going to be uh, in terror of everything that comes in. And I'm not going to be shrinking back and, and going the opposite direction. You have a plan. I'm going to follow it. I am standing in the in, in your protection. I'm standing in what you decide for me to do. I am your child. I'm family. And you are praying for me and you want me to succeed. Now there may be people in here that don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Some, I, I see the people that I have seen come on here today and I recognize each one of them. But there are others that watch this at times other than when it's live. And you may not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'd like to give you some, some verses to understand that you too can become a part of the family of God. Romans chapter 10, starting verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. God makes it easy for us to enter the family. There's nothing you or I can do besides saying, I accept your free gift. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. We're accepting what he's already done. He's handing it out to us. He's just saying, will you take it? It's free to you. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you're battling some of these giants in your life, and you want the help, the same kind of help where that John, uh, high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for the believers, that prayer can be for you too. He wants to see you overcome. He wants to see you, you prosper. He wants to restore you to relationship to Him. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I can pray a prayer with you right now if you're interested. Pray this from your heart. If you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, He can forgive you of your sins and set you free. Just last week, somebody that we know uh, went to a church service and he went not knowing Jesus. He didn't want to go down forward to pray. He prayed where he was at. He got radically saved. He met Jesus in the pew. He just didn't walk up there and say, Hi, I'm Jesus. No, he asked Jesus into his heart, and we have seen things change in that young man's life in this one week. God is on the throne. People are getting hungry for the things of God. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I would, I would admonish you to turn to him. Ask him to forgive you. I'm going to say a prayer, and as I pray, I'm going to pray, pause in between some sections here so that you can repeat as a guided prayer just to help you. But you pray from your heart, asking God to forgive you of your sins, and He'll hear that prayer. Amen? Let us pray. Dear God, 
I realize that I am a sinner. And I realize I can't make it to you on my own. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus came and lived and died for me. I believe that you raised him from the dead. And I confess him as Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, praise God. Welcome to the family of Almighty God. You went from being unsaved on your way to a devil's hell to save with your name written down in heaven. Amen. Let me know if you prayed the prayer today. Let me know if you prayed that prayer. Do it many different ways. You can do it in Messenger. You can send it privately to me. If you've got my phone number, you can text me. You can put it in the comments in, in one of these. Or you can go to an email, contact us at fgfellowship.org. I'd love to hear that you accepted the Lord. I want to encourage you and everything. That's, that's the reason for asking you to, to reach out, as well as confessing. Confessing that Jesus is your Lord. It's part of the process. Each week we close out with our benediction out of Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and the Lord give you peace. As you go throughout today, don't shrink back, don't return back to yesterday's. Move forward into what God's got for you. God bless. Love you. Pastor Jeff Fairley. See you next week.